This morning I want to speak to you on a subject entitled Picket Fences. And it's something that God spoke to me just in December. And as I was thinking about that and thinking about you guys, God was speaking to me about how many, so many of us in the body of Christ are inhibited in our walk. We've allowed hurts in the past, offenses that we've taken to kind of throw up walls in our life that literally restrict the flow of His presence inside of our life. You're like, is that really possible? Is it possible that things that have taken place in my past are literally inhibiting me right now to this day? Absolutely. You read it in, in, in Matthew chapter 13 when Jesus was in his own hometown. And as he's preaching in the synagogue, the Bible says that they took offense at him. They were offended at Jesus. And because of that, he could do very little miracles inside of the hometown. You see, it is possible that we let hurts and offenses get inside of our life and it blocks the flow of what God's trying to do in our life. And this morning, God has sent me here to say, if we're going to go where he's going, you and I have got to receive the healing that he's bringing because he wants to take us to a greater place. How many of you believe that? Yes. So I want to talk to you this morning about picket fences. And if you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 17, verse 1, they're going to throw it up on the screen. Luke 17, verse 1. It says this, it says, Then he said to his disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come. It's impossible that no offenses should come. But woe to him through who they do come. And then also in Matthew chapter 24, you don't have enough time to turn there, but it's going to be up on the screen. It says, And then many will be offended. Jesus speaking of the last days, speaking of the day that you and I live in. He says many are going to be offended. How many is many? A lot. He says many are going to be offended. They will betray one another. They'll hate one another. He's talking about the church here. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Father, I pray this morning that you'd communicate through your word. Lord, we're transformed and changed in understanding your word. Lord, let it not be the voice of some simple preacher that's up here. Lord, let it be God's voice, Father, that begins to communicate to our spirits to truly set us free so that we can go to the places that you've called us to. Lord, I ask that you'd anoint us in Jesus' name. And everyone that agrees with that, say amen. amen. I learned a long time ago that our decisions determine our destiny. Our decisions determine our destiny. Where we are at today, this destination that you and I have arrived at, is because of decisions that we've made in the past. And so if that's true that decisions determine destiny, you and I have to begin to decide things differently today if we're going to go to the place that God's called us to tomorrow. And so that's what I want to speak to you about this morning. And as I was thinking about picket fences and fences, I started thinking, I wonder about the famous fences in history. So I've got a couple pictures I'm going to throw up, and let's find out if you can identify them real quick. Let's throw the first one up there, this one here. The Great Wall of China, that is one big fence. You can see that thing from space. I've never been. I've just seen the pictures from space. But how cool is that that somebody thousands of years ago built a fence? Why? They wanted to keep people out. How about this one here? The Berlin Wall. One side communism, the other side freedom. People risk their lives trying to cross that fence. And, and literally because they want to get their family to the other side, they knew that there was freedom on the other side and that they were restricted on the other side. And how great it was. I remember the day whenever I was just a young, young man, kid. And I remember the seeing the wall tear down. I didn't understand it at that time. Now being a student of history, I realized how big that really was. Tear down this wall. And it came down. How about this one here? That's the U.S. border fence. It's your tax dollars hard at work. <laughs> Stretches for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles in different locations where they're trying to protect the, the purpose, trying to keep people out. You can't p keep people out. People know that there's, there's opportunity there. And if, I'll tell you, if, if I was on the other side of that fence and I'm trying to provide for my family, I'd do everything I could to get to some place where I could provide. Let's see. How about this one right here? Come on, man, Texas Motor Speedway right there. <laughs> that is one famous fence. I remember the first time that I went there and just watched it. You sit right there, right up next to the fence, and as those cars come by, the wind comes past, and you can feel it just whoo, hit you right in the face. It is so cool. <laughs> Anyone been there? Come on. We don't have to, yeah, all right, just four or five of you. Come on. All right. How, how about this one? This is a favorite of my, my daughter's. 
Josh and the big wall. I would show you a, a wall of Jericho, but if you know your Bible, it, it's not standing anymore. And so I found this one. My daughter loves the veggie tales. And I wonder from time to time how this is going to affect her knowledge of Bible. Because I know one day she's going to be sitting in Sunday school and somebody's going to say, well, how many of you guys know about the Battle of Jericho? And my daughter's going to be like, oh, I know, I know, I know. That's when the peas got up at the wall and, and they threw Slurpees down on, on the Israelites. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 that's, that's not the way that that... But that's what it does in, in Josh and the Big Wall. They're trying to teach Bible. And sometimes I'm a little curious about that. It's hilarious. I love it. Um, here's, here's a famous fence that I think everybody in here will be able to identify. <laughs> that show was on the air for years, and we never got to see the guy's face. <laughs> Now that I live in, in a little suburb, little area, and I've got my own little backyard fence, it's kind of interesting that you do begin to relate to your neighbors that way, don't you? That's the way you know them, is, is just a little top of the head over the top of the fence as you talk to them. Um, fences have a very simple purpose, and it's to keep things out or to keep things in. That really is. They're, they're defensive in nature. We put them up, in a sense, to be able to say, stay away or let's keep something in its place. And with that in mind, that's the reason why whenever I was driving through my neighborhood and I saw this right here, it, it struck me a little strange. Because somebody had taken a picket fence and they put it all up in their front yard, and you know what? It looks pretty on the outside, but you know what it says to everybody else in the neighborhood? Stay out. And as I was driving past that, the Lord spoke to me. He says, some of my children behave that way. We look all pretty on the outside, but we've got these walls that we've placed up of protection and defense that we say, stay away. Don't come any closer. Look, I've got it all together. Everything's all nice and fine. But the truth is we're sitting on the inside and we're hurting. A picket fence really isn't any defense whatsoever. You could hop that. You're not even keep a dog inside of that type of a fence. It serves no purpose other than to say, just stay away. And that's when the Lord spoke to me. He says, so many of my children behave this way. And I was thinking about my daughter when she came into this world. Every child is born without a wall. Every child is born without a fence. They're naive. And you know what? It's supposed to be that way. Jesus said, if you're going to come into the kingdom, how do we come? Like a child. But yet, as we get hurt in life... As things take place, what do we do? We start throwing up the fences everywhere to be able to say, you know what, don't come any closer. Don't touch me. Don't hurt me. And so we start erecting these fences in a sense. And the truthfully, if, if we get honest with one another, a lot of us are sitting out in the sanctuary today and are watching on television. And, and what you're discovering is, you know what, if I'm honest with myself, I've got these fences that I've put up of a fence. Things that have hurt me in the past, and I've allowed that to become a restricting point. Remember what I shared? Jesus was unable to minister in his own hometown. Why? Because they were offended at him. If he's going to take us to where he's going, we've got to drop those things. Jesus warned. He said what? He said, then he said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. Guess what? It's going to happen. You and I are going to be offended. But woe to him through whom they do come. And that word offense in the Greek, it's, it's a word that means scandalon in the Greek. That word means a stumbling block, an obstacle, or a snare that would cause one to sin. Now, I brought a snare. <laughs> this is a rat trap. This is not for some little bitty mouse. This is for those big, like, you know, horse-like rats that get inside your, your house or whatever, you know, that you've got to kill. This thing is, this thing is deadly. Some people are freaking out right now. It's like, he's going to pop his finger on that thing? I, I do this because one of the best ways of understanding what that word scandalon means, oh, this is, this is scary. <laughs> that piece right there that you attach the bait to is in the essence the word that scandalon is talking about. A snare, a trap that sits in front of you an offense, just waiting for what? For you to take offense and grab it. You're worried, aren't for me? How many of you guys are worried for me right now? <laughs> I tell you what, I don't know any easier way to do this. We'll just do that. There you go. You feel better? <laughs> this is the way that it works because the enemy, what he wants to do is throw offenses. Jesus said it's impossible. They're not going to come. They're going to come. 
You and I are going to have all these little traps laid up in front of us. Some of them the enemy has placed there. Others, the enemy's just waiting for some precious brother or sister in the body of Christ to come and create an offense. And the enemy's like, I'll use that. And what happens the moment that trap is set? And pop, we're like, that hurt. And because we get hurt, we say, that's not going to happen again. And we throw up a fence. I want to talk to you about four fences that I've thrown up in my own life. I'm going to be real personal and just honest with you because I think if, if we're going to talk, we, we just have to be transparent. The very first fence that I've had to deal with is this one right here. Unmet needs and unfulfilled expectations. When God spoke to my wife and I about coming out to Texas, we dreamed really big. Boy, we had dreams. We were like, man, this is our expectations. This is what's going to take place. And Man, God has done some amazing, amazing things in six years. I've been blown away of what's taken place. But you want to know, very little has happened the way that I expected it would. I mean, I knew we were going to have to fight. I knew it. Because the devil's never going to give up any ground without a fight. But if I'm honest with you, I wasn't expecting the fight to be as hard as it has been. I, I, you know, I, it was a, a, a joy to be able to come and work for my pastor. You know, being somebody who has so profoundly touched my life through revival, to come and just sit at his side. But I didn't know that I was going to have to be at his side while he went through cancer. I didn't know that the enemy was going to bring that along the way. I just wanted us all to come together and say, you know, what? we're just going to sail right through and we're going to see this Metroplex come to Jesus. We've got to fight. I've got good friends in ministry that have gone to churches and they were promised this or the expectation was this and whenever they get there because of one circumstance or another things don't fold out the way that they thought that it would and the church isn't able to, to uplift to its obligation that it said or maybe that's just God chose to do something completely different and what happens because their expectations aren't met, they get hurt. They get offended, and I'm talking to them on the phone all the time and having to pray with them and saying, you know what, trust God, trust God, trust God. Don't take the offense. Don't get hurt because it's a trap. And that's what we do. The expectations don't come in, and all of a sudden we're like, you know what, nobody's going to do that to me again. I'm not going to allow myself to get hurt, and so we build that fence. We throw it up and we say, you know what, I'm going to protect myself there, and I'm not going to ever let that happen again. But also unmet needs. My love language is quality time. I love spending time with people. You know, a gift, um, an attaboy on the shoulder, you know, a hug, someone just, you know, just telling me that they love me doesn't mean quite as much as somebody says, hey, can we just hang out for a little bit of time? It means a lot to me. Well, in this environment where we're always go, 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 and always just pushing and advancing, you don't always have enough time to just sit down and enjoy a cup of coffee with somebody and just spend time. Sometimes an attaboy is all you get. And if I'm not careful because one of the needs I have in my life is somebody to sit down and spend time, I get offended. Or I'll watch somebody else get to spend time with someone else, and I'm like, man, I really want that. And I start to get offended. And what do I do? I throw up that fence, and I say, you know what? I don't need them anyway. I'm just being honest. You got to be careful because it's a trap. And if you allow the enemy to bring it into your life, he's got you and you're hurt. You've thrown up that fence. But that's just one of them. The second one is this, misunderstandings. Communication is something I love. And I study communication and it blows my mind on how easy it is to say something and other people take it a complete different way. It's like, I meant this, but you took it that way. And I'm like, sometimes even after a message, people come to you like, Pastor Daniel, when you shared this right here, it blew my mind. I'm like, I didn't say it. I looked at my nose. It's not in there any, anywhere. <laughs> Jen and I have lost dear friends because of misunderstandings. I'll never forget a project that I was working on with some very close friends. And because of a misunderstanding that came up on this project that we were working on, we both got hurt in the process. I was unable to communicate to them maybe the expectations up front or at the same time maybe just to communicate through the process how things were going. Maybe I wasn't able to. But because there were all these blanks that were left open, the enemy had no problem coming in and taking out a pen and saying, well, I'll fill that in for you right there. This is what they're thinking. This is what they're saying. And honestly, you know what took place? They truly, truly believed that my wife and I took advantage of them and lied to them. 
And I can see how they felt that way, and I, I can promise with everything that's inside of me, we did everything that we could to make sure that we represented ourselves 100% honest, but we lost that friendship, and to this day, we don't have it. And I've done everything right, and as far as I know, to be able to help to restore and bring reconciliation. I believe that that's going to take place, and I don't share that story with you this morning so that you say, well, I feel bad for you, brother, and I'll pray for you. I've learned that most battles that I fight in my life are self-brought. So many times we're sitting back, we're saying, Lord, just get the devil off my back. <laughs> and the truth is, most battles I've fought are self-brought. Things and decisions that I've made that have caused it, and I've got to take care of it. Use his wisdom and his understanding to be able to come in. And I've been doing that, and I'm praying and believing that that's going to take place. But every single one of us, if we're honest, we've had those times where a misunderstanding has come in, maybe with a leader that you respect or a family member, or maybe in a relationship between a couple. Boy, the enemy loves to come in like that, doesn't he? smack it hurts and what takes place is when that happens we take that fence and we say you know what I'm not going to be hurt like that again nobody's going to get that close to me again and so we take that fence and we put it up and we say never again not going to happen that's the second the third one that I've dealt with is this one unjust treatment and I've this fits into two different categories. There's real times that people treat you unjustly, and then a lot of times you perceive it to be that way. You take it that way. But regardless, either way, it really hurts. I had a very dear pastor friend whenever I was growing up as a teenager who was active in my life, and we spent a lot of time together. A lot of who I am today I owe to him. I'm appreciative of that time. But as I grew up and I went into ministry at my church, he moved on and went to another church, and the relationship got strained. And there was a missions project that we were going to work on together. And I was looking forward to that because I thought, oh, this is going to be a great opportunity for some reconciliation. Great opportunity to be able to hang out with them. But man, it fell apart. Before I knew it, my name's being drugged through the state. My reputation's being ruined. I had to call him up and release him from the trip, and it was one of the hardest things to do. And it hurt. The people that are closest to us really are the ones that can hurt us the most. And what happens is when a family member, and in the body of Christ, we're all family. We're brothers and sisters. That's the way I see you. It's the way I hope you see me. Because of the close proximity of coming together, we open ourselves up to be hurt by one another. And I've watched people in church, when something happens that's right or maybe not right, all them church people, they're all just the same. We're brothers and sisters. And if you've ever grown up in a big family, Brothers and sisters fight. We get so close to one another, we know the stink on each other's breath. Right? And the worst wounds that I've seen people endure, and many of us in this room have endured, have been through family. And when it takes place, what do we do? Nuh-uh. Nobody's getting that close ever again. And so we throw up that fence. We say, you can't come any closer. You've got to be careful. It's a trap. The enemy's trying to kill you. Freedom. The last fence that I've dealt with is this one. Unjust, unrighteous judgments. I told you the family and church are so close. As you get closer and closer to one another, you really start to see each other. You start to understand how that person really is. I had a mentor in my past that I loved. I in a sense from afar, thought, man, this person is amazing. They're awesome. And I had an opportunity to work closely with them, and the closer and closer that I came to them, the more and more of their flaws kind of begin to show up. It's real easy from a distance to receive from people. But when you start coming into close proximity with them and you start seeing the flaws and everything, it really starts to grind at you a little bit to where you can't receive from them the way you used to. The only person who's perfect is who? Jesus. So that means every single one of us come in a very distant second. If you're looking for perfection, look to him. Don't look at me. Don't look at anybody else. I'm going to disappoint you if you come any closer. But here's what takes place is because what I noticed is I got closer and closer and closer to them and I began to see the flaws which were existent even when they ministered to me before. Is that I began to judge them unrighteously and began to relate to their flesh and not their spirit. 
And because of that, I could not receive from their flesh or their spirit anymore because I was offended at them. They were the same person they were before. And this is the thing in the body of Christ. Whenever we come close and close to one another, when we come close to a pastor, when we come close to others that are in there, we've got to understand I cannot get offended at them because the moment that I do, I'm going to pull myself back and I'm not going to be able to receive from them anymore. I have watched this happen time and time and time and time again in church. There are people who go from one church to the next to the next to the next to the next. Why? Because they got offended in the last church because maybe they saw something they didn't like and they judged it unrighteously. I have learned the way that you leave one place is the way you enter the next. My wife and I have to be so guarded when we meet people who have come from other churches because I always pay attention to the conversation. If it doesn't take long for them to start telling me everything that was wrong in the previous church, I know. Go ahead and mark the days on the calendar because sooner or later they're going to be saying the same things about here. It, we are not called to leave offended from anybody. In fact, in Isaiah 55 verse 12, it says that we should go out in joy and be led in peace. When it comes time for God's season to remove you from where you are to take you into the next, you know how you ought to be going? And it's not that they're sitting in the church going, Yay, finally we got them out of here. <laughs> Bless God. Go be a blessing someplace else. No. With hugs and joy and peace, we all celebrate the fact that God is moving in their life. But let's be honest. How many times do we really see that take place? What did Jesus say in the last days? Many are going to be offended. They're going to hate and betray one another. We can't be offended with one another when we get close. There's still gold inside of them. And we've got to relate to them according to the Spirit. But what have I done whenever I've seen that take place is that I'll throw up these fences. Let me, here, this is for pastor's benefit. It's got to be absolutely perfect. <laughs> I don't want it to drive you insane, Pastor. Here we go, right? Kleenex box in my way. <laughs> there we go. Well, look what I've done. Unmet needs, unfulfilled expectations, misunderstandings, unjust treatment, unrighteous judgment. I've gotten offended and I've built a pretty little fence between you and me. We're now separated. And I'm happy where I'm at. <laughs> I hope you're happy where you're at. Let me just, you know, and I've seen ministers do this from the pulpit. They get up here behind that pretty picket fence and they don't want to touch. Why? Because they've been offended and hurt and they're saying it's not ever going to happen again. We're not called to live that way. We're not called to live that way. And what am I doing? What, what am I communicating? I'm communicating. Keep out. There you go. No trespassing. I, I love this one. Beware of dog. <laughs> How many of you guys have one of those dogs like that? How many of you it's a chihuahua? Here we go, wait a minute, another no trespassing sign. Posted private property, hunting, fishing, trapping, trespassing, or any purpose is strictly for, prohibited. Violators will be prosecuted. <laughs> yeah, don't touch me. Let me put that one right there. And then another beware of dog. Yep. There you go. Isn't this the way so many of us sit inside of our families and sit inside of our congregations and sit inside of our churches like this right here? Check out what Solomon said in Proverbs. He said, an offended brother is more unyielding than a fortified city. Disrupts. Disputes are like a barred city of the citadel. I feel safe like this, but you know, there's a false sense of security. Because what I say, it's a picket fence. There really is nothing to keep me protected. And the only people that I'm going to allow on this side of the fence are those that agree with me. And what are they going to do? Reinforce my position and my mindset. Whereas probably the people God wants to use to speak to me to really work something out in my life are on this side of the fence. So something's got to take place. 
Something's got to happen because what I have learned, go, go to the next slide because what, what I have found is whenever I've allowed this to take place, I might as well turn these signs over because the truth is what I'm communicating is pride. Because I've got it all together right here. I don't need anybody else. Everybody else has hurt me. It's all about me. Or bitterness. Boy, I've met some bitter people. So hurt. Or this one, envy and strife. I get in this position. I see how God's using other people and I get envious. I'm like, man, why can't God use me like that? It creates friction and strife between me and another brother or another sister. Anger and resentment. You get upset. You're hostile towards God, hostile towards the church, hostile towards others. You begin to resent. Boy, I could have made a whole list of a bunch of other things. I'm just talking about the things I've seen in my own life. I'm being honest with you. This has been me. Blame. It's not my fault. It's their fault. God, if I hadn't married that woman, this isn't me. <laughs> but I know how sometimes we've thought in our life, boy, God, if I hadn't married that woman, you could have used me to do great things. But because of them and them being a thorn in my flesh or whatever, Lord, it has kept me restricted. Or, boy, if, if he behaved a little differently, God could use me to do something else. Or if it hadn't been for this brother or this sister or this pastor who kept pushing me down. What are we doing? Blame. What Jesus said, it's going to come. You're going to get offended. The other one, unforgiveness. This is the big one. Because when I'm sitting on this side of the fence, unwilling to forgive the people that are out there, you know what it does? It blocks everything. What did Jesus say? He said, forgive and you will be forgiven. For in the measure that you forgive, you will also be forgiven. You realize there's going to be a lot of people in hell who sat in church and thought everything was okay, but because they harbored unforgiveness in their life, Jesus said, I can't forgive you. I can't release you because you're not releasing somebody else. What was that parable of the gentleman who owed a fortune that he could not repay? He comes to the king and the king says, you know what, it's completely canceled. And he goes out to somebody who basically owes very little and he says, I want it and I want it now. And the king says, you know what, come back. I forgave your debt even though it's something you couldn't repay. Now you're going to repay it all and I'm putting your family in prison. This is what unforgiveness does. It restricts the flow. And if you're the head of the household, you're killing your family because you're unwilling to let forgiveness flow inside of your life and let things go. I'm speaking scripture to you. This is the gospel. And so this is the look of so many people that are living in the church world. You're like, Pastor Daniel, how do I know if this is taking place inside of my life? Go to the next slide for me real quick. Because I've learned in my own life, whenever I'm doing this, these are the attributes that I'll see in my life. I become rude. I become harsh with people. All of a sudden, instead of responding to them in love, it's like friction. Or I become hostile. Here's a big one for me, sarcastic. Instead of responding to each other in love and according to the spirit, I get real sarcastic and I start cutting on them. Which is the next one, cutting. I tear people down. We're never called to tear people down. We're called to edify one another and build them up. Don't get around a sarcastic brother. He's offended, trust me. How about when you come into a situation and you come into a room with somebody and you feel a little awkward? Why? Because they're there. Family reunions and gatherings, some a brother that you haven't been able to forgive or hasn't been able to forgive and be able to freely flow back and forth, you feel real awkward in that situation. It causes you to be, behave politically. Meet two people who haven't seen each other in years. They walk up to each other and say, man, it's so good to see you. Lying through their teeth. <laughs> man, I was thinking about you just the other day and I was praying for you today. Why is the, it feels like the right thing to say, but if it's not real and it's not truthful, give the fence up. Gossip. When you are talking about somebody else, there's a good chance you built a fence. Gossip is tearing somebody down in somebody else's eyes. Well, really what I need to do is just be lifting them up and praying for them. And the last one, unloving. Unloving. This one is big. Because how does the Lord say that we'll know each other? By our 
love for one another. I have been around plenty of people who didn't quite understand that Jesus, when he spoke of offenses, saying that these things are going to come into your life, they still allow the offenses to come and they get hurt by them. Satan sends these traps or allows these traps into your life, brings them there. Why? Because he wants to destroy you. God allows them because he wants to refine you. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And I'm just speaking of one limited side of the trials. We're going to go through trials. Pastor shared that message so many, uh, about a year ago that was so great, the trials and tribulations and tests of a believer. We're going to have to go through it. These have come so that your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, and gold is worth an awful lot right now, but gold even perishes even when it's refined in the fire. Your faith, so that it may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I've seen plenty of people who've allowed offenses into their life to completely wreck themselves and derail them from what God's purpose was inside of their life. And they blame everybody. They talk about how, well, if this hadn't happened, if this hadn't taken place or anything like that, I have a question for you. Who's in control? Who's in control? Is the Lord in control? Do we really believe that? Is God in control? Because if God is truly in control, then no man, no circumstance, no devil, no demon could ever get me outside of the will of God. It's only God that holds my destiny inside of his hands. And so I don't have to worry about anybody else inside of that circumstance. It's between me and him. God's the holder of my destiny. He's the one who's taking care of me. And I just have to submit to what he's doing inside of my life so that he can take me to the places that he's called me to go. Remember, your decisions determine your destiny. If the devil had the ability to destroy your life, trust me, he'd have done it a long time ago. But he can't. God's allowing these things to come into our life. Why? Because he wants to refine us. And I have learned that many times that the very vessel and vehicle that the enemy thinks that he's destroying your life with becomes the vehicle that God uses to accomplish the things that he's told you he will do. Maybe I need to say that one more time because you've got to get this. Many times the vehicles that come our way that look like they are derailing us from the will of God on our life tend to be the very things that God's going to use to take you to the place that he promised you. Ask Joseph. Joseph gets a dream from God, and he says, I'm going to be a ruler one day. And his brothers look at him and say, we'll see about that. I'll throw you in a pit and sell you into slavery. Who would have ever thought that that was the very vehicle that would cause him to go to Egypt and put him in position to be raised up to be second in command and become salvation for his entire family? But so many times we hide behind these things. We're like, God, why did this take place? This has got me off purpose. This has got me off purpose. Is he in control? Yes. If he's in control, then nothing's going to derail. Amen. I just have to be submitted to him to allow it to take place. So if you're like, okay, this is me. I understand in my life I've got I, a lot of this is bearing true. What do I need to do? What did Jesus say? Part of the signs of the end times. He said, and then many will be offended. They'll betray one another. They'll hate one another. He's speaking to the church. He says, false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. That word love is agape. Godly love. They could have wrote in phileo, which means brotherly love. Brotherly love, it means if you love me, I love you back. No, godly love. What kind of love did Jesus Christ display? He loved us so much that even though we didn't ask for it or deserve it, he poured out his life unto death for you and I. And we're called to love each other the same way. And he's saying that type of love is growing, going to grow cold. We said it a moment ago. How are they supposed to know each other? How are they supposed to know us? By what? Our love for one another. If that love is growing cold inside of the church, we're in the last days. And something's got to change. And so we've got to get that godly love back into our life. Paul, I love it, in the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, love suffers long and is kind. It does not envy. 
It does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things. Somebody says bears all things. It believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. If you found in your life that the love is growing cold and you're becoming unloving, if you found that you're harboring unforgiveness, if you found that this right here is ringing true, then there's a couple things you need to do, and the first one is this. It's time to drop the act and get real. Drop the act and get real. Pride says, I'm all right and I'm okay. In a moment, I'm going to give two altar calls, one for those of you that are lost and away from God and need to set things straight. The only thing that will keep you from responding to that is pride. But if you drop the act, if you would drop the act, just respond, you would experience his love flooding into your life. But in the same way for so many of us that have these picket fences that are built up inside of our life, we've got to drop the act and just get real and say, you know what, Lord, I'm offended. I'm going to quit pretending. I'm going to quit trying to put up a really great front because the truth is that front that I'm putting up is really keeping me from experiencing you. And just get real with the Lord and just tell him what he already knows. He was just waiting for you to come around. Get real. Admit that you're hurt. Admit that you're offended and take it to Jesus because I tr trust me, you're going to need his grace. You're going to need his strength. You're going to need his power in your life. The second thing that needs to take place is this. You need to forgive the debt. You need to forgive the debt. If somebody has offended me, if somebody has hurt me, release them. Release them. Follow the example that Jesus gave. What did he do? He forgave. They are nailing him to the cross. They are driving spikes into his hands and, and, and hanging his naked body before everybody else to see. He is pouring out his blood. And what does he cry out and say? Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. We're called to be the same. Let it go. Forgive them. Release them. They don't owe you anything anymore. They don't owe you an apology. They don't owe you an explanation. They don't owe you repayment of anything because when I forgive the debt, it's completely wiped away. They owe me nothing. The third thing that needs to take place is this. You need to confront. And I'm not talking about confronting them. It's about confronting you. Confront yourself. If that individual knows that they hurt you, it probably is right for you to go to them and just say, hey, I want you to know something. When this took place, I was hurt and I was offended, and I want you to forgive me. I want you to forgive me because I was harboring a lot of bitterness and resentment to you, and that was not right, and I am so sorry. Would you please forgive me? You're like, whoa, whoa, Pastor D. <laughs> They're the ones who hurt me, but yeah, but you got offended at them. If I forgave them and I released the debt, I'm not owed anything by them, remember? So no, I'm just going to them and confront. Why? Because I'm confronting myself and saying, Lord, I'm going to deal with this and I'm going to lay it down. You're like, I, 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 that's hard to wrap my brain around. Forgive, even, even though they haven't asked me to walk up to them and just, I mean, just release them and then ask them to forgive. Well, it doesn't make sense. Check this out. 1 Corinthians 6, 7, Paul is speaking of, the New Testament church, he says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you've been completely defeated. There should never be a lawsuit among believers. When a husband has to take a wife to court to end their marriage, something's wrong. Something's wrong. When we've got to take another brother to court because of some misuse or anything like that, Something's wrong. Paul says, you've already been defeated. You've already lost. Your love has already grown cold. And catch this. He says this. He says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? That's difficult to deal with. If they've hurt me, I want them to pay. No. No. Why not put myself in the position of saying, you know what, wrong me, cheat me, hit me, I'll give you the other cheek, hit me again. I'm not going to respond, I'm not going to retaliate. Why? Because I have forgiven and I've released. What did Jesus say? 
In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, he said, You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Well, Lord, I can do that. Lord, bring down hell, fire, and damnation on them. Lord, I pray that they would see the light. Lord, I pray that you would just wipe them off the face of the earth. No, pray for them. Philippians 2, 3, Paul writes, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself, which takes me to this one. It will make everything make sense. Pray, pray, pray. Begin to pray for them. Let me tell you how to do it. Make a list of everything you want God to do in your life and begin praying it for them. Lord, it's real hard to pray that you would bless them when they've hurt me. Lord, I'm going through my own financial situations, and for me to pray prosperity over them just doesn't make sense. But if I've forgiven them, if I've released the debt, why not consider them better than myself and begin to pray for them? You see, I've learned this, godly love, which puts itself in a position to be hurt basically says this is no defense whatsoever. There's no protection. And so why live that way? Why throw up the barriers and the defenses and say you can't come any closer? When we were called to relate to one another as brothers and sisters, I need you in my life. And you're like, Pastor Daniel, pray, 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 pray for them. I don't, I don't get that. Let me tell you what happens. Those who sow according to the flesh will what? Reap according to the flesh. If they've hurt me and I hold back unforgiveness, then what am I going to reap in my life? Unforgiveness. If I'm prideful, I'm going to reap that in my life. If I'm blaming everybody, then everybody's going to blame me. But if I switch that over and I grab a hold of that godly love and I begin sowing according to the Spirit, it's going to change the way that I respond and relate to them. Because I'm no longer relating to them according to the flesh. I'm now relating to them according to the Spirit. And when I go before them, I can say, Brother, I was praying for you today. And let me tell you what I was praying. I was praying that the Lord would prosper you. I was praying that in the call that He has on your life, that it would begin to multiply and increase inside of you. I was praying that God would just unlimitedly just open up the windows of heaven and just pour out blessings upon you. I'm not relating to them in the flesh anymore. I'm now calling to what I see inside of the Spirit. And because we're relating Spirit to Spirit, guess what happens? The same thing's going to happen to me. God's, it may not happen there in that situation. I'm not expecting it, remember? But I'm so in according to the Spirit. I'm relating to them according to the Spirit. I have learned this, and I'm going to close with this thought. Even being a part of a pastoral team with brothers and sisters that you sit next to every single day and you labor and you work together, the enemy always looks for opportunities to cause a fence to come between one another. And I have learned whenever I concentrate on those offenses, I start responding to them in the flesh. But if every day I'm lifting them up in prayer as I do, Jesus. as I'm prophesying over them and over their ministry, I no longer see the offenses anymore. I come together and out of love, I start to see increase in their ministry. And I rejoice over that and he starts to increase what I'm doing.